Good morning, everyone. So welcome, students, to assembly, and uh, welcome conference attendees. This is also, uh, today is our Christian Leaders Conference, and we're addressing the topic of what makes counseling biblical. Now, for students who would be used to uh, our normal assembly kind of process and schedule, this is a little bit different. Uh, today is a, is a, a very academic uh, conference, and so the, the speakers are reading through their papers in an academic way, and uh, I'm doing that as well. Uh, so our assembly session is going to be uh, operating that way. Uh, we will obviously be dealing with hashtag Calvary questions, so as you as you have your questions, both for those online who are live streaming and for those who are here, you can uh, uh, tweet your questions on Twitter, hashtag Calvary Questions. After, uh, after I conclude my paper, uh, I will ask our other speakers for the day, uh, Dr. Smith, Dr. Cox, and Dr. Borain, to come join me. They'll, they'll sit at the table here, and we'll have a panel discussion that will be moderated by... Uh, our own Sean LePage, and uh, so we'll have that discussion, and then after that uh, discussion, then we'll, we'll uh, break for lunch and enjoy some fellowship before the conference resumes after lunch. Uh, so I'm speaking on deconstructing psychology, and uh, for those who want to follow along, it's on the screen, and it is uh, available for download on drcone.com. If you want to go ahead and get that, you can. So let's, uh, let's pray and then we'll jump into this, this session. Precious Lord, we love you. We're grateful for the opportunity to come together, share the fellowship of your word, and think through these issues together, to examine your worldview and understand how we uh, should understand the, the world around us and, and human nature and how you would have us interact with each other. As we think about these topics, Lord, we want to handle your word well, and we want to uh, say things that are honoring to you. So we commit our time to you with uh, gratitude and with love, in Jesus' name, amen. Deconstructing psychology. Uh, first, we deal with matters of definition and order of inquiry. Christians cannot trust psychology, says Ed Bulkley, but he doesn't leave it at that. Bulkley wisely clarifies that when speaking of psychology or psychiatry, I'm referring to them in the counseling or therapeutic sense, which involves efforts to diagnose and change human behavior, thinking, attitudes, values, and beliefs through psychotherapies. Bulkley further adds that he is not indicting all forms of psychological research, such as those dealing with physical causes of psychopathologies, the physiological workings of the brain, or other non-value-oriented studies. A later reference is particularly helpful as he narrows the scope of the problem from everything related to psychology to a particular kind of psychology, made evident in Bulkley's disagreement with the idea that without the insights of secular psychology, pastors and churches are simply inadequate to deal with the deepest hurts of modern man. While Bulkley at the first critiques psychology, as he writes, it becomes evident that his contention is with secular psychology, not the discipline of psychology itself. Greg Gifford illustrates the dichotomy in his article entitled, Why Biblical Counseling and Not Psychology? Gifford affirms biblical counseling because we're committed to the Word of God as being authoritative truth. Because the only means of authentic change begins with faith in Jesus. And because the ultimate jurisdiction of counseling falls within the church. Our commitment to biblical counseling is an outworking of our commitment to these stated truths. Early in Gifford's article, the problem is stated as psychology. But as he continues his explanation, it's clear that diagnosis is perhaps too general. Gifford adds, biblical counseling is committed to the fact that in order to engage in psychology, one must be committed to the authority of God's word to articulate the nature of the soul and human behavior. This is where the psychology of biblical counseling differs from secular psychology. Importantly, Gifford recognizes that there is a psychology of biblical counseling. 
John Street maintains the dichotomy as he laments, the principles of psychology are presented as though they were on the same authoritative level as scripture and compete for its jurisdiction as the sole authority in determining the well-being of the soul. Note the dichotomy as be between the Bible and the principles of psychology. There's no third option here. In contrast to the conclusions evident with Bulkley and Gifford, likewise, J. Adams trenchantly asserts that the dichotomy is unbreachable and that if the two options are brought together, the first option, psychology, is taken while the second, the sufficiency of scripture, is discarded. He says this, integrationist counseling seeks to combine the insights of psychology with those of the Bible. Attempted integration of the scriptures with worldly counseling beliefs, methods, and or techniques inevitably means that in order to make them agree, the scriptures are bent to fit the non-scriptural material that the counselor attempts to integrate with it. I believe the task is impossible without ending in a non-scriptural method. The first question that these observations elicit is simply, what in fact is psychology? While Bulkley and Gifford at first condemn psychology in general, they later clarify that it's secular or unbiblical psychology that's actually the problem. Their clarifications illustrate that there may be a third option. Psychology is from two Greek words, suke, soul, and sometimes mind, logos, uh, word or idea. Together, these words communicate the study of the soul and the mind. And has been well communicated in other contexts, in the earlier session, for example, it's vital to recognize the difference between a discipline and a worldview. Psychology, for example, is a discipline, the study of the soul and the mind. Any particular discipline is part of the pursuit of an accurate worldview. So the outcome of psychological inquiry will contribute to one's worldview, just as what an interlocutor concludes about prerequisite worldview concepts will shape one's philosophic, excuse me, psychological inquiry. To illustrate in any worldview, one must first consider the questions of epistemology, how one might arrive at truth, how one might be confident of what is truth, and what basis of authority one can trust in order to ascertain truth. Then one must answer the key metaphysical questions, what actually exists, what is value and good, what is the purpose or design, and what is going to happen. In order to know that one has arrived at the right answers to these metaphysical questions, one must depend entirely on their epistemological conclusions. If one relies on their senses and experience as the answer to their epistemological questions, they'll likely deny the existence of God and the soul because their tools for measuring experience are limited to the physical realm. If, on the other hand, one relies on human reason as the epistemological key, then they may or may not affirm the existence of God and the soul when they begin to address the metaphysical issues. And this is the same in any discipline. One's metaphysic is undergirded by one's epistemology, and the, the ethics prescriptions arise directly from the metaphysics conclusions. One of the mistakes often made in, in many disciplines is moving to prescription before an accurate description is understood. Consider, for example, the mechanic who, upon hearing a slight rattle in the engine, prescribes a likely expensive repair when a closer examination might reveal that a screwdriver had been dropped into the engine area. I don't speak from experience. Okay, I lied. I do speak from experience. It's still in there, by the way. Or consider the doctor who prescribes a medication because a particular malady is suspected but not entirely verified. Often in such cases, the prescription either causes a negative reaction or possibly no reaction at all, which might help correct the actual symptoms. Attending to the symptoms is important, but only with the proper understanding of causations or conditions. In the same manner, there's been a great focus on the methods and tools of counseling, but perhaps not enough attention is being given in popular discussion to the bases of counseling that are rooted in the discipline of psychology, the study of the soul and the mind. Consider that often we'll hear the term soul care, and while we might greatly prefer it to the term psychotherapy, lexically, the terms are synonymous and reference the treatment of the soul and the mind. It's important to recognize that before we can engage in care or therapy, 
we must understand what a soul and a mind actually are. While care and therapy are in the ethics aspect of worldview, having to do with prescriptions of how one should treat the soul and the mind, the actual definitions of the soul and mind are necessarily within the scope of metaphysics inquiry. Before we can consider the prescriptions, ethics, we have to earn those prescriptions by addressing the descriptions, metaphysics. And before we can answer the metaphysical questions, we have to establish an epistemological basis for preferring one description over another. Hume says there's no soul. Nietzsche doesn't care if there is one because we can't know for certain and we can't interact with it anyway. The Bible asserts that the reality of the soul is an undergirding principle of human life, which is correct. What is our basis for preferring one description over the other? Let's look at a case study uh, on determinism and voluntarism and just explore these questions. One particular interesting and important metaphysical disagreement is between determinism and voluntarism. Determinism is the idea that people are not free to choose, but their choices are determined by usually external forces. Voluntarism is a competing idea that people are indeed free to choose and that external forces are not definitive. In the deterministic system, humanity is governed by external forces, by environment and experiences in the perspective of secularists, and by God or original sin in the perspective of theists. On the other hand, in the voluntarist system, human free will rules the day for both the secularist and the atheist, or excuse me, the secularist and the theist. For the secularist, there is no God with which to be concerned, while the theist must restrict the activity of God to ensure that he never violates the laws of free will. It's fascinating that the secularist and the theist can agree on so much once the false dichotomy between voluntarism and determinism is adopted. For the secularist, the devices of determinism are merely vehicles for independence from a creator and the requisite human responsibility. The secular determinist considers that humanity is not accountable for one's actions, and the theistic response is not to counter the undergirding determinism, but rather to simply assert that it is God who does the determining. Likewise, the secular voluntarist argues that one is not accountable to a creator and has varying degrees of culpability for decisions, while the theistic response is not to challenge voluntarism, but rather the source of the free will, as if God has drawn a line in the sand that he will not cross so as to safeguard human free will. In both cases, the foundational principle of determinism or voluntarism as the metaphysical undergirding is often not even considered. It is in this responsive dance between secularist and theist that secular theories of psychology assert human independence from God. And while the theistic response is to refute the conclusion, it doesn't often refute the foundation itself. Sigmund Freud and B.F. Skinner, for example, were both overt in their determinism, though their responses to treatment in light of that deterministic foundation differed greatly. Skinner's determinism importantly serves as the very basis for the behavioral sciences. Skinner suggests that if we are to use the methods of science in the field of human affairs, we must assume that behavior is lawful and determined. We must expect to discover that what a man does is the result of specifiable conditions. And once these conditions have been discovered, we can anticipate and to some extent determine his actions. On the other hand, Thomas Zaz argues from the voluntarist perspective, acknowledging that my opposition to deterministic explanations of human behavior does not imply any wish to minimize the effects, which are indeed significant, of personal past experiences. He says, I only wish to maximize the scope of voluntaristic explanations. In other words, to reintroduce freedom, choice, and responsibility into the conceptual framework and vocabulary of psychiatry. J. Adams, the father of neuthetic counseling, appeals to Zaz repeatedly in his Competent to Counsel, suggesting that based on Zaz's observations, there seems to be little question then that much rethinking is called for, and Christians ought to be foremost among those engaged in such rethinking. 
While none should question the wisdom in Adam's challenge for Christians to rethink and lead in that process, it is curious that he appeals to a secularist and a voluntarist to provide an impetus for progress in the discipline. It's also worth noting that as a Reformed thinker, longtime Presbyterian pastor, and full Calvinist, J. Adams would be most comfortable with the determinist versus the voluntarist perspective. As the voluntarist approach would have been more compatible with an Arminian understanding of human volition and its relation to God. The point here is that secular psychology is built on certain foundations, and only some of those foundations are being exposed by their theistic practitioners, while others are adopted without consideration. Ultimately, the issue is whether or not God has authority over his creation and whether he has the authority to operate outside of the restrictions of either determinism or voluntarism. But how would we answer this central question? metaphysical question. Let's deconstruct, let's peel back the layers of psychological inquiry. It is generally recognized that there are three divisions of history relative to scientific inquiry, pre-modern, modern, and post-modern. This threefold division considers the modern era with Descartes' rationalism and Bacon's scientific method as its centerpiece. The pre-modern era was a time of superstition and unexamined beliefs, illustrated in the myths of the Greek pantheon. The post-modern era is a reaction to the failure of the modern era to deliver peace and prosperity through technology, as instead the modern era ended with the crash of world war and atomic destruction. Roughly a millennium before the modern era began, Greek philosophers like Parmenides and Heraclitus began to lead Greek philosophy into naturalistic pursuit. The idea was that in order to find reliable answers, we must begin to examine the world around us and dispense with any ideas of the supernatural, instead preferring what we can interact with, looking within the natural realm for our answers. The Greek naturalists were doing a form of science that was very limited but their naturalistic presupposition would have great impact on forthcoming generations. While these Greek naturalists were largely secular, later theists like Thomas Aquinas appealed to natural law as sufficient to offer us the metaphysical explanations we sought. Aquinas certainly recognized a creator but modeled epistemological and theological methods that enabled one to look to the creation rather than to revelation for life's great answers. His Summa Theologiae showed how an entire theology could be developed absent a dependence on special revelation. The Protestant Reformation represented a return to the text as the epistemological basis for answering the metaphysical questions as Philip Melanchthon in particular addressed issues of the soul and mind and is credited as having a thoroughgoing psychology and perhaps as even originating the term if Volkmann's assertion is correct. Descartes followed the Thomistic model rather than the Reformation example with natural law rather than the text providing the epistemological foundation for discovery and with an acknowledgement of the Creator, yet with little dependence on His Word. Uh, pardon me. Uh, Descartes' rationalism and Bacon's scientific method won the day and set the course of inquiry for the next four centuries. Now, wisely, both men recognized the limitations of scientific inquiry and their rationalistic moorings, but the discarding of special revelation was comprehensive enough that as psychology developed, there was little call for considering biblical foundations. As Galileo put it, the intention of the Holy Ghost is to tell us how to get to heaven, not how heaven goes. Galileo's comment illustrates the growing schism between science and the applicability of the Bible. And by the time Darwin arrived, there was an increasing number of people who viewed the Bible to be inaccurate pertaining to scientific matters. And Darwin's evolutionary suppositions continued to sway opinion, particularly in the scientific community. For many, Darwin's theory provided the final naturalistic nail in the divine coffin. As Nietzsche would put it, we have killed God. As this type of scientific perspective made God unnecessary and irrelevant. And as one clever soul put it, the immaterial has become immaterial. Immaterial. 
It is from within this seedbed that modern psychology became prominent as a discipline. By that time, Melanchthon and the other reformers' influence had been long eclipsed by the naturalistic foundations of Darwin and Nietzsche. And in the mid-19th century, Wilhelm Wundt worked to establish a physiological psychology that would be an interdisciplinary bridge between physiology and psychology, contributing to both. Wundt applied experimental and research methods used in physiology to the discipline of psychology, including inductive experimental science, and ultimately he sought to develop a scientific metaphysic that would explain all aspects of spirit and mind as related to physical processes and stimuli. In seeking metaphysical answers with empirical means, Wundt used necessarily limited methodology to search for answers that extend far beyond the capacity of the naturalistic tools. Like the Greek naturalists long before him, Wundt was pioneering a discipline with a deliberately limited worldview without understanding, perhaps, what would be lost by shutting the door to the possibility of the extra-natural. <clears throat> it is evident from Wundt's work that the problem is not in the discipline itself, just as none would argue the importance of an empirical physiology, applying empirical methods to any inquiry has great value as long as the subject can actually be observed. The problem arising from Wundt's program was that the epistemological presuppositions that met metaphysical truth can be arrived at through empirical means, and that's not a problem with the discipline, it's deficiency in the worldview. Wundt, widely uh, recognized as the father of psychology, brought a worldview to his discipline, shaped his methods accordingly, and set the trajectory for all who would later engage the discipline. Wundt's presuppositions and worldview footsteps are shared by many later contributors to the discipline of psychology. Some later students of psychology would agree overtly with the worldview foundation of, of Wundt and would consequently not question the prescribed methodologies, Others might not recognize that Wundt and the empirical discipline he pioneered were di directed by naturalistic presuppositions. And they would also fail then to question whether the assumptions and the method were too narrow. Ivan Pavlov observed what has been coined classical conditioning, providing empirical data to undergird behavioristic and deterministic ideas. Sigmund Freud recognized there were other major influencers like experience, culture, and environment that would shape the psyche. In studying those especially, he found the deterministic factors that he thought provided greater explanation. Jean Piaget applied the same principles to developmental psychology, recognizing that the human psyche develops differently in early years. Carl Rogers built on Nietzsche's self-focused existentialist ideas to encourage self-actualization and to minimize judgment. B.F. Skinner's behaviorism and operant conditioning were built on the same deterministic and materialistic premises as Wundt's ideas. Abraham Maslow developed a human hierarchy of needs that attempted to account for the material and immaterial needs of humanity, but all within naturalistic limitations. Scores of other influential thinkers have pursued the discipline of psychology through the lens of the humanistic, naturalistic worldview and all arrive at similar results. Not because they are engaging a wrong-headed discipline, but because they have engaged the discipline through the wrong lens. The task for us is to acknowledge that the discipline can and must be engaged with a holistic perspective on metaphysics, recognizing that the material cannot provide comprehensive explanations if humanity is in fact also comprised of the immaterial. Further, if reality extends beyond the natural, then we must also be willing to engage the extra-natural or the supernatural. If we're willing to recognize this foundational key, then we can and should certainly engage scientific pursuit but should do so without discarding the Creator's voice. To be certain, the Creator's voice must be recognized as the certain authoritative data on any subject, if indeed He has created. Let's make three observations as a, a preface to psychological inquiry. 
When we deconstruct psychology, we observe three things. First, the discipline of psychology is in itself not at odds with the Bible, nor does the discipline necessarily disregard the authority of the Creator. Just as in any other discipline, the foundational premises will shape methodology, and methodology will shape one's understanding of reality. If one begins with the epistemological premise that God is the source of authority and that his word is the authoritative communication of his truth, then if one is being consistent, one will engage the discipline of psychology just like any other discipline through the lens of the scriptures, being totally subject to their authority. The discipline is not the problem. Incorrect premises and presuppositions are the problem. There's nothing inherently wrong with pursuing the knowledge of the soul and the mind. In fact, such pursuit is necessitated in order to understand the work God does in sanctification and our connectedness to that work. Second, the discipline of psychology must first be descriptive and then prescriptive. The discipline attempts through various methodologies to observe influences and factors that shape the psyche. If one limits methodology due to the wrong epistemological premise, as does the humanistic naturalist, then the descriptions will largely be wrong, even if there are many truths to be observed along the way. Further, it would be foolish to discard truths discovered in any discipline simply because their discoverers hold to wrong presuppositions and employ limited methodologies. Truth is truth. And discarding truth because of disdain for the one who discovered it or, or for the means by which it was discovered is akin to the logical fallacy of ad hominem against the person. Gravity is gravity, whether Newton's beliefs align or do not align with ours. Newton didn't create the law of gravity. He simply discovered and considers the natural laws in place that affect gravity. Still, the key limitation of the science of psychology is in its inability to offer prescriptions necessary to properly treat the psyche. Science can arrive at accurate descriptions if the right assumptions and methodologies are applied, but prescription is another matter altogether. Just as science can teach us how to clone animals, for example, science cannot tell us whether or not we should. We must look beyond the scope of empirical science to help us with these ethical questions. A thoroughgoing psychology must, A, be built on proper epistemological foundations, B, must accurately describe the reality of the human psyche and its relationship to the creator, and C, must arrive at proper prescriptions. Science, with its empirical limitations, cannot, cannot, accomplish these three things. It can contribute, but it can't fulfill them. The discipline of psychology, by definition, then must extend far beyond the empirical, or it will be, to borrow my brother's word from earlier, insufficient at best, and totally misguided at worst. It cannot be simply scientific, but must include broader processes. A third observation we must make in deconstructing psychology is the absolute necessity of reconstructing psychology properly. We have observed that throughout the history and development of psychology, many influential thinkers have worked from naturalistic premises. Consequently, the trajectory of the discipline has been largely limited to empirical observation and has been markedly anti-supernatural. Yet, if we've indeed been created, and if the Creator has communicated to us in the Scriptures, then we have been provided with the foundational principles and the continually guiding truths upon which to properly ground the discipline of psychology. In the case of our being the products of the Creator, we must look to our Creator to understand His perspective on who and what we are and how we are to care for Him, for others, and for ourselves. Soul care or psyche therapy or whatever else we may wish to call it can be rightly engaged when we get the descriptions and the prescriptions right. His word on the psyche, the soul, the mind, etc. is the first and final word. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. It is because of this universal truth that we are warned by the Apostle Paul to see to it 
that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of this world, rather than according to Christ. Philosophy according to the traditions of humanity with limited humanistic perspectives and according to the basic observable components of this world is simply empty deception. That philosophy keeps us in bondage. However, if on the other hand our philosophy is according to Christ, that is no empty deception. That is not bound up in the basic principles of the world, limited by what we can observe in the various laws of nature. Instead, we discover there our freedom, because he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through him. He is the creator who speaks to us with authority, who knows the design of humanity, and is the ultimate standard of what we are intended to be like. If we fail to pursue that kind of philosophy and the disciplines that stem from it, then we are relegated to be, as Joyce puts it, the fallible man who attempts to speak authoritatively. That man has always been with us, both comforter and misleader, even struggling to fit his rules around the oldest of mysteries, the one that the Greeks call the psyche, cognitive scientists call the mind, and people of faith call the soul. And so ends deconstructing psychology. Let me invite Dr. Smith, Dr. Borain, Dr. Cox to come up and join me. And again, you will have... Uh, opportunity to ask questions. Sean LePage will moderate, carrying the microphone, and of course, hashtag Calvary questions. And you can all wake up now. Mr. LePage, we are at your service. Okay. Is them a little bit more? Good morning, everyone. How are you all? Uh, uh, what was that? <laughs> Fantastic, great. Well, I'm going to start with this one. Um, someone said, you thought you would just quote Pirates of the Caribbean and we wouldn't notice. <laughs> I did not catch it, so what is, what is that about? The immaterial has become immaterial. It's one of the greatest lines. That, uh, that, that franchise is filled uh, with philosophical beauty. All right, nice catch there. All right, well, uh, let's begin with this. The, the title of this conference is What Makes Counseling Biblical? Would uh, one or, or more of you please explain that title and, and, and why it's relevant to all of us? I would love to explain the title, but then that means I give away the last part of my, uh, my presentation, so, <laughs> yeah. Okay. I can't do that. Okay. <laughs> uh, then Dr. Beret, would you please? Since, uh, <clears throat> since my children have nicknamed me the master of the obvious, what makes counseling biblical is the Bible. Amen. Um, I'm pretty new on staff, so I hope I still am when I'm done here. <laughs> the reality is there's a war that's been waged for about 50 years. And I'm actually, in my presentation later, going to discuss why I think the word biblical's not a very good word. And what I mean by that is I think it makes a bad adjective. And so... To be honest, the context when we say biblical counseling, when it's used by a lot of these authors, has a presupposition that other views of counseling are not biblical, even though they disagree. And then all of a sudden the conversation gets reduced into who's more biblical, or who believes the Bible more, or who uses the Bible more. So I like, um, as Dr. Cohn has presented it this way, Rather than what's biblical counseling, the title refers to, okay, do we have a view of counseling that is true, congruent, based, use words like centrality in scripture, or have we 
bought into a psychological system that was developed in the last 200 years that's based on completely secular naturalistic thinking. So I'm not sure I like the phrase biblical counseling because it's who's saying it and who's hearing it, but we're trying to get to what is true to scripture and how God would really provide us with tools to really help people. That's my view, so. Biblical counseling is really a pregnant term. I'm not gonna talk about how it became pregnant. That's, that's another story, but the idea is, like you, like you said, uh, Jeff, when we, when we are referring to biblical counseling, uh, half of the audience that you might be addressing in that realm is going to have a very particular philosophy and worldview in mind, and the other will have a very different view. And so what we're trying to do in this conference is explore what it actually is and to, and to, to be talking about something as biblical, why that is, is vital. So I, I appreciate all of these perspectives, and, and especially uh, my brother... Luther's theatrics there. Well done. Well done. That's a teaser for later. Y'all got to come back. <laughs> You'll like the term when we're done. <laughs> All right. Just raise your hand if you have a question. Um, yes, sir. Let me, let me throw this one out uh, first. Uh, I'm going to rephrase this, this tweet a little bit to make it a question. For those trying to keep up, uh, does empirical... I uh, mean, based on experience, observation instead of logic and reasoning, and uh, deconstructing, does that mean taking apart, examining? Uh, does relegated mean demoted? Yes on the first, yes to the second, and I don't think I used the third, but I, I would vote yes. Uh, so uh, the first was uh, empirical. Uh, empirical would be uh, observational. Uh, the second was uh, deconstructing, which is uh, uh, the idea of tearing down something with the purpose of being able to build it up again, understanding its ingredients and its contents. And then the third was relegated. And I'm not sure the context, because I don't think I used that word, but um, relegated, relegated. I'm trying to think of the context that, uh, that that word has been used. I'm going to do a quick search of my document here and see, did I use relegated? This, Comments, this is gentlemen? live TV, folks. It is live TV. This is, this is, this so don't leave me hanging guess. here. You're killing me. No, just kidding. Relegated. Boom, there it is in the last paragraph. If we fail, it's probably on the screen. Uh, if we fail to pursue that kind of philosophy and the disciplines that stem from it, then we are relegated to be, as Joyce puts it. Uh, I'm, I'm essentially saying there that if we're pursuing the wrong philosophy, then, then we are destined or doomed to, doomed, I like that, we're doomed, to, to be the fallible person uh, claiming authority claiming that we, we're speaking correctly when we've gone the wrong way. There, there's just no other, there's no other destiny or end result for us. We may have some truth mixed in there, but we're, we're going to be so messed up as to miss the point. So thank you for uh, paying more attention than I did to my verbiage. <laughs> um, just, a, just a question from a local church pastor. Um, why can can you folks as professionals maybe address the idea of why the violent reaction to the word psychology? I've run into people that that uh, you know Dr. Cohn's reasonable look at psychology this morning they wouldn't even want to take a look because it's just completely anathema and I don't want anything psychology and. Actually, I've also found a lot of those people probably could stand to work through some issues in their life, maybe. But, uh, but I just, I just, why? Uh, I mean, other than the, maybe the negative reaction of Sigmund Freud on our culture, uh, why, why the knee jerk? Why is it? Why? Why is there such a violent reaction uh, among church people? Um, I appreciate that question. Um, there might be various reasons as to why. Um, one of the main reasons that I observe as to why there's such a knee-jerk reaction to it is because uh, we examine some of the teachings of psychology as uh, Dr. Cohn has uh, out, laid out uh, pretty, pretty brilliantly and succinctly. We see the damage 
that these particular worldviews have had on people, right? And because of that, um, there, is a, there is a fear, right? That if we embrace this discipline, that we have to embrace wholesale the worldview of the discipline. I think that's one of the things that Jay Adams was trying to address. Um, he, you know, he, he got it right, you know, that, that, that if you look out on the psychological landscape, there's a lot of uh, good, there's a lot of people that are making observations and it's, in some cases, it's not helping anyone, it's actually making them worse, right? Why would you embrace a discipline that, that, that has made individuals worse, right? And so as a result of it, you know, people vacated that in, in record numbers and we're seeking for an alternative to answer back, to clap back, if you will, that particular, that particular discipline. So it, it's not without, you know, the fear is warranted. I, 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 I totally get it, I totally understand that. Um, um, it's just that the, the, the perspective, as we've laid out so far, it's not the discipline that's the issue. It's, it's the worldview within the discipline itself. So, Thank you. Anyone else? You know, I appreciate, if I can just add, I appreciate a comment that uh, Dr. Brain made <clears throat> earlier in, in the earlier session. Uh, he, he brought up the, the issue of uh, creationism, creation science, creation versus evolution. <clears throat> that if we took the same approach to, to that question of creation versus evolution, that we have taken, and I say we just in general, on the question of psychology, we've abandoned, the church has largely abandoned the discipline of psychology because it's been overrun by, uh, by a, the secular worldview. If we did the same thing with respect to, say, the creation-evolution debate, um, we would be abandoning all of science together. And, and the idea is we just simply can't do that. Uh, we, we, we are obligated to engage in these inquiries. And it's interesting, psychology is one that maybe creates more of a visceral response for people because of the, of the godlessness of the under, un, undergirding worldview and, and the damage that it's done. Yeah, let me just <clears throat> piggyback on, on what he said. Um, if it were not for, in my opinion, if it were not for a book that was published in 1961 called The Genesis Flood by Whitcomb and Morris, we would have abandoned uh, all participation in scientific endeavors. But because of that book, which I think ignited the, the modern creationist movement, you have organizations like the Institute for Creation Research, Answers in Genesis, and the Center for Interdisciplinary Creation Studies right here at Calvary. Um, I think we're, we're up against uh, a nearly unwinnable battle in terms of psychology versus, as a discipline versus a humanistic worldview. I say nearly unwinnable because I don't think we've started it yet. Uh, hopefully, um, this conference starts it. Specifically, you said like the visceral response. So I'll give you the counseling perspective. I would ask what someone afraid of, okay? And then I think if I investigated that further, because of the way the debate has been framed, there is this zero sum game, meaning psychology means something else. And it's not just that it's perhaps secular, it means this, that somehow is threatening my personal belief or my church's belief or my denomination's belief on this very important issue. How do I look at the authority of scripture? And once you framed these discussions, which we're trying to unframe it in that zero sum game, then psychology means to the person who hears that, 
that the Bible is no longer authoritative, authoritative, that evokes fear in me, and then anger is what's going to come out. And that's what I would say is happening when you see people respond that way. So how you would have the conversation is begin discussing what is the fear. And probably you're gonna end up in a discussion about the authority of the Bible, which is, they wouldn't be so mad if they didn't hold the Bible dear and it valued it and it's changed their life. I mean, it, it is strong. I mean, it is the foundation. And in their mind, it's been created this either or, so. So I think uh, uh, as a follow-up to that question, I think the whole discussion of descriptive versus prescriptive is really important. Uh, Dr. Cohen, would you be willing to give us a few examples of the difference um, that, 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 you know, highlight the fact that psychology is a science, um, except when it starts becoming prescriptive? So maybe I'd start with a biblical concept or biblical example, and I'll deal with this in, in a later session. Um, but Paul, when he writes Ephesians, his first three chapters are entirely descriptive. In other words, it's describing the reality. I would suggest Ephesians 1 through 3 is, is tied with Romans 1 through 11 as the greatest work on psychology known to man. Paul is describing He's describing who we are, how we came to be that way, what we were before, uh, what we have, what tools we have, all of these things. He's telling us all about this. And then in chapter 4, verse 1, he says, therefore walk in a manner worthy. So now it changes from descriptive, describing how things are, which is he deals with the epistemological, how we can know, the metaphysical, uh, what is reality. He deals with that in the first three chapters. And then starting in chapter 4, verse 1, he gets into the ethics of it, uh, telling us what we're supposed to do, and then even the sociopolitical, what we're supposed to do together. So all four components of worldview, Paul deals with that in Ephesians. He does the same thing in more depth in, in Romans. And the, the, the distinction between those two is so vital because if I'm prescribing without having an accurate description, uh, I'm, I'm almost certain to come up with the wrong prescription. And if I'm counseling somebody, for example, uh, to, uh, to resolve disunity in their marriage financially by getting separate bank accounts, because that's a quick fix, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm not at all helping them to under... By the way, nothing in, inherently wrong with separate bank accounts, but, but if... if the psychology of, of who we are is, is that we are one and that we are walking together and we're supposed to be these, this brother and sister in Christ, right? Uh, then to, for me as a counselor to be advocating anything separate is not counseling based on the description. It's prescribing based on an entirely different uh, description. And so I can be borrowing that and in, instead, I should be, I, personally, in, in the counseling that I've done in marital and premarital, I would be taking them back to who are you in Christ? What is a husband? What is a wife? What's your responsibility to each other now? How can you express that specifically in your relationship to deal with these unity issues? So description must be in place in, in order for us to earn the right to prescribe. And I think that's, that's the key piece is psychology is doing the descriptive work as a discipline. That's what it does. But the, uh, the prescription part is the result of, of psychology. That's what I would distinguish between psychology and counseling. They're related, but one comes first, if you will. Uh, my brothers might have a different uh, or additional comment. Okay, we have a question back here. Um, back to... <clears throat> what he was talking about, about the reaction against psychology and some of the things that you all have said thus far. Um, it, it was mentioned earlier that about the roots of, or the foundation of psychology and how that that was um, basically built on principles that were humanistic and, and not any biblical foundations. And evolution is the same. Evolution and that theory was actually 
trying to get an alternative view so that they didn't have to accept the biblical perspective. And so I would, I mean, it seems to me like the problem, at least my reaction when I think about the difference between psychology and, and the mixing uh, of the two, the problem with what Dr. Brain was talking about, how we got in that shape to start with, that we needed the Genesis flood and all that, is because at the beginning we tried to mix evolution and creation and try to harmonize the two and thought that we could hold hands and, and be nice and play together. And in the process, um, Christianity always goes down to tube when we do that, when we compromise. And uh, it just goes further and further and they hold our hand and pull us further into the ditch and we're the nice little kids on the block and we just follow along. And it's the same thing, I believe, with psychology. I think the reaction, my reaction, is that when, when you try to mix two things that are that have totally different foundations, and the psycho psychology, the very big roots of it, are anti-biblical, anti-God, humanistic. So when we try to combine the two, when we try to hold hands and play nicely together, again, I think people react because what's happened and what continues to happen is it all goes haywire. It, so we're running out of time. You, what, so, what's sorry, the that's it. What's the, um, what, the question is, how, how is that not a problem? That can be a problem, but one thing I liked, in fact, I highlighted over there in Dr. Cohn's presentation, he talks about um, ad hominem attacks, meaning this. Even if the foundation of the discipline is flawed, it doesn't mean there can't be observable truths that actually might line up with scripture. So how this works, and we don't like to think about this, but I grew up in a very um, conservative, traditional um, faith, and I never heard empathy talked about much. Now, just to be honest, it was a fundamentalist Baptist, okay. And um, it wasn't discussed a lot in helping with people, feeling with them, things like that. And all of a sudden, now you see it in all sorts of Christian books. And they would attribute that to like Brene Brown now. And she's very famous TED Talk. And here's what I think does happen sometimes. We begin with the presupposition that the traditions of faith we grew up in, the theology was always completely accurate. So all of a sudden, you don't look at a passage in Hebrews about a high priest being touched with the feeling of our infirmities, the hypostatic union, meaning he feels what we feel before other things are discussed. You don't look at passages like in Romans when it talks about weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. And all of a sudden, the Bible starts opening up uh, all these poetry passages that talk about empathizing with other human beings is very important. And I can say this. I'm not saying I didn't. I've grown up in church my whole life. I'm not saying I never heard a sermon on it. I didn't hear very many at all. And then all of a sudden, psychology emphasizes because they're observing that human beings react to that and all of a sudden it's like wow I hear a lot of good theology on that now actually looking at those passages where it wasn't looked at for the last 60 or 70 years from a Puritan belief that's not what was talked about it was a lot of behavior modification and things like that so I get that it can be from a faulty foundation but I also see things that when we look at it, all of a sudden we look at scripture in a different light as well. And scripture was always there, okay? I don't know why there was no books on empathy written strongly in you know, the first hundred years of America being formed. I don't know, those passages were there. It's just they weren't observed. And so I think that's usually my response when somebody asks that. But I do, I'd go back to the quote on the page because when Dr. Cohn put it out there, the, the usual response is because these foundations are bad, it's bad. And I'll say this too, and I'll talk about it later. We're beginning with the root of psychology being 200 years ago. That's not accurate. It's not even accurate that it goes back to the Greeks. Old Testament prophets, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, were discussing psychology hundreds of years before what modern psychology would claim was their beginning with the Greeks and stuff like that. It predates that. The Word of God was there teaching some of these principles, and I would say our current psychological um, phenomenon, they just grabbed a hold of them later and take credit for them too. I think that happens. Just to piggyback on what my brother had said too, I, and we are 
with this conference diagnosing the problem. The problem in itself doesn't lie with the practice. It lies with the uh, uh, assumptions that we make concerning man, the origin of man, the substance of man in this practice and how to go about best doing that in, in connecting and counseling and guiding individuals. In other words, we are, we're not, this is, we are, we are with you in that we see an issue, but the issue doesn't lie with the discipline. The issue lies with the, with the worldview. Uh, just to piggyback on what you had said, Jeff, the, one of the uh, first discourses in psychological thought was written by a theologian um, in the second century. Ironically, who was trying and attempting to create a, uh, an argument against the material world, against the, the, this, this aspect against the material. He used the argument of psychology. The, now, the term wasn't invented then, but the, the reality of the human soul to basically uh, create a defense against that man is just material. So um, I, I would have to assert that, that, that the problem doesn't lie within the discipline itself. It lies within these arguments that are found within the discipline and whether or not they're real or not. That's, that's where the argument is. I just want to add a, a couple of things to that. <clears throat> um, we have a discipline called theology <clears throat> at Calvary University. All right, We study theology. Guess what? There's good theology and there's bad theology. And the question is not which theological system you adhere to or to which theologian you subscribe to. The issue is what does the word of God Amen. say? Amen. That is the issue. I hear all kinds of arguments. Excuse me, we don't argue here. Discussions. <laughs> Uh, between students and faculty members uh, about Calvinism versus Arminianism, um, covenant theology and dispensational theology, all of which I'm going to deal with in my presentation after lunch, all of which are human constructs. Okay, and I don't know if you realize it before, but Anything constructed by humans inherently has a flaw in it, <laughs> okay? So, um, so yeah. So <laughs> let me add one comment and then, uh, uh, and then I'm gonna close this session in prayer so that, that you can eat lunch. Uh, <clears throat> just a historical note. The, the issue that, that you, uh, accurately described wasn't caused because Christians were wanting to play nice and get along. It was because of fear. It was because the, the uh, secularists were doing observational science and drawing conclusions. And I don't know of any Christians sailing around on the Beagle uh, studying biology who wrote works. I don't know of those people. It was guys like Darwin. <clears throat> and, and the Christians, as they're hearing this, <clears throat> Uh, if I may use another a line from Pirates of the Caribbean, the, the Christians were cowering in their bathwater as, as secularists are doing science, and we capitulated. We stopped doing science uh, because we realized that we couldn't do it as well as them, and so we adopted what they said as true, and in order to not throw away the Word of God, we had to accommodate, we had to bring uh, the, these, these quote-unquote scientific principles into the Word and come up with all kinds of crazy theological gymnastics to do that. Uh, the, the idea is not to be friendly or unfriendly to the philosophies of the world. The idea is exactly what Dr. Brain said, what does the Word of God say? And as Christians, I believe we have a responsibility to engage these disciplines. It's the whole point of Calvary University, to engage these disciplines so that we know what God has said and how we're to apply it uh, in daily life. So the history matters there, and I really appreciate that. It's a great question. And if we walk away from a discipline because, and I'm not suggesting at all that you're, you're advocating this, 
uh, to be clear. I'm not disagreeing at all with you. Uh, but if, if we as Christians walk away from these disciplines, we have wasted a stewardship that God has given to us. And I'm really proud of these three men and uh, our other staff and faculty at Calvary and others who are engaging these things because they're, they're willing to do that. So thank you, men. Uh, let's give them a hand for their willingness to do that. And let me go ahead and close this session in prayer. And, and uh, students, forgive us. Uh, your questions went on so long that we've made you late. So let's, let's pray. Precious Lord, uh, again, we, we're thankful. We love you. And Lord, as we ex explore these things again, we just want to uh, understand and, and stand on what you have said. So thank you. And I thank you for uh, the, every man and woman who's here and who's watching this live streamed and just engaging this conversation that, that we would all be aware of the stewardship you've given us and we'd be faithful with it. Lord, thank you for the food and the fellowship that you've provided. Uh, we appreciate that very much, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all and you are dismissed and the conference will resume at one o'clock.